So let's talk oil pans and give you an update on our turbo slant build and throw some like left field Mopar trivia at you, okay? Uh, before we talk about oil pans, and this kind of ties together, let's talk about this turbo slant. The block is still at the machine shop. We're waiting for them to, to bore it 60. That's the only thing that's being done to the block. Um, God, I was hoping to have it back by now, but I'm not going to rush them. They'll get it done when they get it done. Um, in the meantime, we were going to work with that cylinder head we showed you in that last install, or the first install, I don't know, the last cylinder head we were going to use, the peanut plug head. And it had been damaged by porting, some careless porting. So the intake seats were no good, and it was going to need new seats. So after we examined the head, really looked at things, the guides are sloppy. The, one, of the, one of the factors in determining whether a head is worth putting seats in is the condition of the guides because they, you can't put the seats in on an engine with sloppy guides. The guide is what holds everything. All right, so at any rate, we decided, no, let's just pass on that head. And I've got this one here. This is a, it's not a peanut plug. It's a regular old style drool tube head. But it's in beautiful condition. It doesn't need any seats or anything like that. And we're going to do our cleanup porting and, and prep this for the turbo build. So, and we'll hold on to the other head. I don't know what we'll use it for, but eventually it'll get fed into the mix somehow. That's that. And the other part is the oil pan. Stuby has been doing some oil pan fabrication. And this is pretty much what we're going to be talking about. Uh, all right, the, the off the wall Mopar trivia, okay? People look for the HP stamp on an engine. Is it an HP motor? And this is whether it's a you know a 33 or 440 or you know anything that would have HP or high performance engine. And people will right away say, well, it's a higher compression engine. Yes, most of them were. Some of them were depending on the year, but some of the things that HP motors all had were uh, uh, dual valve springs, you know, with a damper inside, um, a windage tray, stuff like that. But they also had special oil pans. When you see an engine that's got HP stamped on it, it means it has a baffled oil pan. So here's this. Okay, this isn't this isn't a very good comparison because we've cut this pan apart. We cut the sump out of it, and we'll get to that in a minute. But you see here, this is a factory HP small block oil pan, and it has an acceleration baffle here so that the oil so when, you, when you hit the gas okay the oil wants to head to the back of the back of the pan it makes a wave and tries to come over the top so they added this acceleration baffle to keep the oil from coming up this way and then this deceleration baffle so when you slam the brakes the oil comes it hits the bottom of this and stays in the sump and you can see here here's a standard 318 pan, 273, 318 pan, and you see there's no there's no baffles here. It's just, you know, the oil can just slosh anywhere it wants to. So if you're into Mopars and you see HP on an engine, you know that oil pan, big block or small block, is going to have baffles right, in addition to the windage tray. All right, so, okay, oil pans. It's something that, you know, nobody pays any attention to until it gives you trouble. And actually, come to think of it, that's what happened with when we built our slant. We found trouble in the oil pan. And it took a few different tries before we finally got it. We nailed it to where there's no issues with it. So I'm going to show you what we're going to do with this pan. We're going to duplicate the pan that I did on Stubby's pan. We'll get to that in a minute. So people don't really pay attention to oil pans until, you know, it's necessary, until, until it bites you somehow or another. There are some, car, some engines, some cars, like I've always been, anytime I've ever built a bigger or small block Chevy, I was always jealous when it came time to do the final buttoning up because the oil pump is at the back, the little stubby oil pickup is there, and then you get that beautiful sump at the back of the pan. It's just, you know, it, it could not be more perfect for our purposes, for high performance purposes. The reason for that is because the cars that those engines went into were front steer, all right? Meaning that the steering box and the center link pass in front of the front cross member. So there's nothing in the way in the back to keep the engineers from putting a nice deep rear sump in there and, and just packaging everything neatly at the back. Uh, you can't beat it. Mopars, on the other hand, or an exception would be like, like pickup trucks, Dodge trucks, they have a rear sump 
uh, but the cars, the car, the, the traditional Mopars that we deal with, they're all front, they're all rear steer. So this, the the steering box and the center link and everything is behind the K-frame, and because it's all behind the K-frame, they had to make allowances. And if you look at if you look at this pan right here. So here's the back of the pan, right? Where on the Chevy you'd have this beautiful sump. And here's the back of the pan, and these indentations right here are for the steering to pass through. And that's why that's why Mopars are at an oiling disadvantage when it comes to oil pans. And it's also a reason why these baffles are so important. On a rear sump pan, you don't need it, you don't really need a deceleration baffle, at least not one this size. The oil is still gonna want to stack. When you, you know, when you when on a hard acceleration, oil is still gonna want to stack up against the back. Of the engine, um, you know. All right, I'm going to do a whole video on oil stacking at some point because it's it's actually a pretty interesting topic. But it's 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 kind of it's off off the beaten path of this. So there are many reasons why you would want to increase the size or or re-engineer your oil pan. Here are some of the factors. Right, you've built an engine. Like an engine combination that revs higher than what it was originally intended to be to be revved at. So you've got an engine that had, that was an oil pan that was designed for let's say 5,500 RPM, right? It's got like the engine has a 5,500 RPM red line. I know they'll spin higher than that, but that's the red line, right? Now you take this engine and you build a 7,000 RPM motor out of it. Well, that extra RPM takes extra oil from the pan. It circulates it through the engine, and it doesn't always have the time to return to the pan and, and complete that loop during, let's say, a, a, a hyper, you know, a, a run. You're making a, a pass at the drag strip, but you just, you know, making a run with the car, right? It doesn't always have a higher RPM. The oil doesn't always have a chance to return successfully to the pan before it has a chance to start sucking bubbles, and then you got problems. So that's one of the reasons why you would want to do it. Second is you build an engine. And you've got a high volume, high pressure oil pump. Well, even at redline, even if you don't exceed the engine's original redline, and, and when they do redline, if engines are designed around a specific operating range, and redline has a lot to do with that. It's you know the oil pan, the oil capacity, all of these things all add up. The the, valve, the types of valve springs that they use, and so on and so forth, all add up to what that quote redline is. And, and the whole engine is sort of designed around that parameter. You know, it's going to have a redline of you know that's it. You know, it's going to be a 5,800 rpm motor. It's going to be a 6,500 rpm motor, and and the the engine is designed first around that pow that that desired power range okay so now you increase the capacity the volume and you increase the volume and the pressure of the oil pump well now it's going to be sending more oil to the top end of the engine and there's a good chance that you'll put so much oil up in the valve covers or up in the upper end of the engine during a, a, a blast right that cavitation you know you start you start sucking bubbles and and that's it right so those are reasons why you want a greater capacity than stock. Oil cooling has something to do with it also. The deeper the pan, the more undercar air hits the sump, the cooler the oil will tend to run. So in our case, we don't need to add oil capacity to this slant six pan. We need to overcome its design limitations. So again, we're dealing with a center sump pan because of the configuration of the car. It has a, a rear steer. So we're, we're stuck there with the factory put the sump, but we've got to make it deeper. So you see here on this high, on this high performance pan, you can see where, where there's even stock. So here's, here's the cutoff. Even stock, there's a respectable distance between this height and this height. Okay, but when you get to the slant pan, like we're dealing with on this, we don't need capacity. What we need is an area where the oil can stay down in the sump. When when this is in the car, okay, this is mounted in the car and it sits pretty much exactly the way it's sitting right now. The oil level, you know, five quarts. The oil level is just sitting stagnant right here. So even if you were to, to do a baffling job right here, 
it, it's still the oil level is already above it. It's already getting caught up in in the in the the rear of the engine, the crank and the rods. Terrible situation. Once that oil is trapped in there, it stays there for the duration of however long you're on it. That oil is at the back of the motor and it's just churning around, which means it's not in the sump doing the job it's got to do. And so that's why we added this sump. So this is how you do this at home. Uh, aftermarket oil pans are expensive. If you can fabricate one yourself using, you know, junk parts, well, I mean, you're better for it. Here's how we fabricated this one using junk parts. So... What Stubby did, Stubby did, did the, the lion's share of the work on this. So what Stubby did was he cut the floor out of the original oil pan. Okay, and we're going to save this. I'll get to that in a minute. We took rough measurements of how deep we can go before the pan is under the K-frame. Okay, and then we cut, we took a 318 oil pan, this one here, and cut the sump completely out of it. Okay, and then transferred it to here. So obviously, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm terrible here. Let me go like this. So obviously the shape of this pan and the shape of this pan are drastically different. So here, here's the floor and here's what we're working with. Okay, and you can see the gaps, the differences in the contour, no matter how you, no matter how, how you turn this thing, it, it doesn't fit. So there's, there was a great deal of blacksmithing involved in this. Go ahead, guys. Make fun of my welds now. Go ahead. Let's get it out of your system. Yes, I know. I know your grandmother could have done better with some wet linguine and, and a mop, right? I get it. I know, right? Uh, but there was a lot of blacksmithing involved in this. And the way you do this to create that, that harmonious, I mean, it's as harmonious as you can get with a backyard butchered oil pan, it'll look a lot better once it's all cleaned up and painted, is... You tack it in several places. You get it close. You get it close. And you tack it wherever it's close. Then you start blacksmithing it. Uh, we use a, a, a map gas torch, okay? And just uh, this area is in, let's say the bottom of it is in. I should have cleaned my hands first. Look at that. Come on. We should have cleaned this pan first. Stubby, why didn't you clean the pan first? So, uh, you blacksmith this thing, whatever is in on the inside, you heat and tap out, you know, just a dull red, right? Tap out until it meets this, or vice versa, you tap this in until it meets that. You tack it, you go, you tack it, you go, you tack it, you go, you tack it, until finally you've blacksmithed this thing together. And I got to tell you, it actually looks, it actually looks pretty good. You would never really know that those are two completely dissimilar oil pans. It takes time, you know, it takes time. You just go at it slow, you know, and just tap, 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 tap. Now, one of the things that you're gonna run into if you're gonna do your own oil pan, especially if you're a cheap bastard like me and you insist on sticking with a flux core welder, flux core welds can tend to be porous. And also, when you're tacking, you'll tend to get porous spots. So if you've got a tack every, let's say, five inches or so, and you weld into that, there's a good chance you're gonna have porosity there. So what we'll do, the next step with this, is we'll take this pan and we'll fill it with water, find out where it leaks. I know it's gonna leak, I'm not worried about it. Find out where it leaks, grind those areas smooth. Here's the thing when, you, when you're dealing with, with this sort of stuff. So let's say, let's say you, uh, you check it and you've got a leak right here, okay? The tendency is gonna to be to take your welder and try to lay a bead over the top of it. Don't do that. Grind it clean. Grind it clean, grind it flat so you've got the whole area that that gap is exposed and then make it like it's a new weld. It, from, just from my experience, if you try to fill the holes, they never fill. It'll always, it'll always be seepage and weirdness is there. So. The other thing we ran into with this is that the, the uh, don't be afraid of the oil, the, the oil drain plug location. So on this on this pan here, the original oil drain plug is at the back, as they are on like just about every engine, and we ended up having to have one here at the front, like a like a five like a like a fox like a five liter fox body. You know, it's got, it's got that oil drain plug right at the very front. So we've got that. Why do they? always put the oil pan when it's possible why do they always put the oil drain plug at the back instead of the front 
Well, because when you change the oil, you jack them the car up at the front and the oil all goes to the back of the pan. So that's where you want that. So I, I know, it's just little things will drive people crazy, but no big deal. The drain plug can be wherever the drain plug's gotta be. Um, the other thing we have to do with this pan, and again, like, like, I don't know, we're talking about slant sixes here, but these principles apply to like all engines, really. One of the things, one of the unique problems with the slant six pan is the proximity, on, this is on the 225 engine, the proximity of the pan to the crank and, and counterweight assembly. And then you got the same thing here. Here at the front, there's only about a quarter of an inch. So what happens is, Oil that, that's coming down as the engine is rotating, oil that's coming down here will, will want to stay in rotation. And it creates this, it, you'll, you'll suck a good portion of the amount of the, the, the total amount of oil that's in the engine. It'll stay in suspension here. Gravity, it, gravity won't take it down and the, an acceleration won't move it back. It's just being whipped and it'll stay up there. And you could use, you could lose half a quart just there. And then at the back, like I said, we've got to add an acceleration baffle here because even though we drop the sump so we have capacity, we still, and it's not even capacity, this thing will probably still only get a five quart fill. But the idea is to get the oil level down low enough that we can put a shelf here and then the oil can't head back and end up in windage. You know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a big deal. There's, not only is there power, you know, to be lost with windage, but oil capacity. The more oil that's stuck in that rotating assembly, just, just getting whipped around and, and, and just bouncing off of stuff and staying together, oil wants to stay together. It wants four ropes inside the engine. The less there is in the pan. You, know, you can have a completely functional, in theory, you can have a, a pan that's completely functional that has enough capacity on paper, but yet you lose so much in windage that it, it'll still suck itself dry. So there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things, you know, there's a lot of things. Um, and then the other thing we have to do is we're gonna have to make a pickup for this. So when you're dealing with, with prefab popular oil pans, there's almost always an aftermarket pickup that will work for you. But when you're dealing with, when, if you're dealing with an odd wall, like we're doing a slant six, there's no deep aftermarket pickups available. So you have to adapt or modify. In our case, what I use is, a, 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 a 318, 340, 360, 318, a small block oil strainer. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll screw that into the slant block. It, it'll, it'll give us an extra inch and three quarter of depth, almost two inches of depth. If you screw that into the slant block and then you, you heat and bend and twist and bend and contour and bend, you can get it to sit flat. So you can modify a small block oil pickup to fit the oil of a, a modified to deepen some slant six pan. And then the last step is that while this pan is not tremendously deep, uh, you know, as you can see, it's still significantly deeper than the stock pan. So this area right here is going to be vulnerable. And so we're going to add, we'll trim, we'll trim this down. This will be the original floor of, of this pan here. We'll trim this down and make a skid plate. So that if, if the, the car does bottom out on something or road debris or whatever gets in the way, it, it'll the skid plate will keep it from ripping the pan open. Yeah. So that's it. Lots of reasons to, to give some focus. If you're building an engine, lots of reasons we're building a car to give to pay real attention to the oil pan. Right, some of you guys, like I said, you, you're lucky from the get-go. You know, you got a bigger small block Chevy or you know, lots of engines that have that big, beautiful sump just exactly where God wants it to be. And then you have these other things, and you know, you, you gotta you gotta think the whole thing through. Think it all the way through. That's what it's all about, right? Hot riding is a thinking man's game. I'll see you tomorrow.